Hello, everyone, and welcome to Peace Talks, a talk show dedicated to improving your strategies for communication. <clears throat> My name is Arden Lee. I am your host, and I am so pleased to welcome tonight a cultist, comics writer, <laughs> <laughs> magician, what else? So many things that and you do, Scotsman. and modern day philosopher. <laughs> modern day Scotsman. <laughs> Grant Morrison. Yeah, you <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Nice to be here. So, it's been now what 16 or 17 years since yeah. the the talk at, that you gave at the disinformation conference that's now become really a cult classic behind magic and behind philosophy even and of course you talk a lot about um your experience being abducted by aliens in Kathmandu yeah. because you went to Kathmandu to be abducted by aliens much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i got lucky <laughs> And I wanted to start there because you learned this amazing and beautiful lesson about essentially unity conscien mm. consciousness in, on, our, on our planet and mm. in, our, in our solar system. Can you tell us a little oh, bit yeah, about that I mean, to start? And I kind of, I mean, I always described it as abducted by aliens because it sounded so cool, and especially in the 90s when everyone seemed to be getting abducted by aliens and I didn't want to be left out. But I've, I've come to the conclusion that what these events really are, because what I went through was an event that anyone who's who's been through any kind of shamanic training, anyone who's been, you know, uh, caught up in satanic cults, anyone, anyone who has had this peak experience basically went through what I went through. And I think it's actually, it's, a, it's an event that's just a kind of perspective. You know, when kids are five years old, they can't see perspective in, in paintings, they don't understand it. But when they get to seven, they do understand perspective. And I think there's a state of human consciousness that's and I, I hesitate to call these things higher because I think they're just nested states of consciousness that are all very useful. But there is a state that elevates us above the four dimensions of space and time that we traditionally inhabit. You know, so we've got our three space ones and we've got one time thing that we can only move through physically in one direction. But there is a, there is a perspective that allows us to see beyond that. And what that perspective suddenly reveals is that the universe is, is an entire, it's a frozen four-dimensional block of space-time. And everything that has ever happened is, is continually occurring simultaneously all the time. So that's what happened to me. <laughs> it was, uh, after climbing a bunch of stairs in Kathmandu, there's, there's 365 stairs to the Shwayambhanath Temple, which is the temple of the self-created one. And apparently any devotion performed there is like 8 billion times more more extravagant, more powerful than any other devotion anywhere else. So me and my friend decided we'd have this enlightenment by running up and down the 365 stairs. And yeah, it came along. So I had this understanding of, of how things operate in time. And I realized that what we actually are is, is uh, just forward facing elements of a, a procedure through time or processes. So in order, as I always explain it, in order to get here tonight, all of us had to come in through the door and we wind back to five o'clock this evening and that's still happening somewhere we just can't walk there it's a direction we can't point to but in our heads we know it's happening so to be here we had to be the people we were an hour ago we, to be here we had to be the people we were 20 years ago to be here we had to be the people we were 30 40 50 years ago depending on how old we are and that process is what we are this forward facing slice of it which seems like an individual is actually part of a process that runs backwards through time. And so if you add the time dimension, you go right back into your mum, she goes right back into her mum, and it's all like buds on a tree. And the whole thing goes back, the entire process goes back through time into the first mitochondrial cell dividing the Precambrian oceans three and a half billion years ago. So what it reveals, what that perspective re reveals is that everything is intrinsically connected. Every living thing is undeniably connected on this huge branching fractal tree which is it's an imminent entity it's here all parts of us are occurring right now and i think it's also why you know you can explain sort of things that seem supernatural phenomenon by thinking well if everything's one singular structure like a giant mega anemone of course we can feel other parts of the structure so of course we can experience other lives of course we can experience things that seem telepathic of course we can experience there's no stranger or more supernatural than the fact that I, my fingers do that when my head tells them to. So 
that was what I saw in Kathmandu. It was, it was this vision of everything as a huge connected, undeniably connected in time entity. And one of the things that you say about that too is that we as, as human creatures, yeah. you know, as, as individuals, which also, as you said, is one of the greatest lies that we're, <laughs> lies that we're sold mm -hmm. in, our, in our current society is the myth of the individual rather than the unity consciousness collective, is that as individuals, we don't mm -hmm. recognize what we are. We don't recognize mm -hmm. that we are all part of the same creature, essentially, that began as a single cell, you mm -hmm. know, as bacteria that was getting split apart by the heat of the sun yeah. and mutating and, and <clears throat> ultimately evolving to the room full of all of us here. And so when we fight amongst each other, as has been happening so much in our culture, particularly within the past year, it's like we're punching ourselves in the face. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it's like I say, it's like the fingers on your hand deciding to have a war. It's kind of, it's not much use for the hand <laughs> when the fingers have a war. So yeah, no, that's, that's one of the problems we have. And I can only guess it's because as highly differentiated tendrils of this giant organism, we, the humans have really highly evolved brains. Our neural architecture is super elaborate and intricate, so it allows us to have this much wider self-awareness than the rest of the structure. And I think one of the things that we're quite plainly doing right now, even though this, we seem divided, I think it's important for the structure to learn as much as it possibly can. So it has to have multiple viewpoints. And unfortunately, some of those multiple viewpoints will contradict and when people believe they're individuals, those contradictions can lead to conflict and to war. But really all they are is signals that the entity needs as much information as it can possibly get. And that information includes all the bad stuff and all the wars and all because it's learning, it's what, what are its limits, what are its possibilities. And these are part of its possibilities. So I think that structure, what we're seeing it doing now is develop this super connectivity using technology, which is of course it would do. It starts to use the material of the environment that it lives in to fashion what is now a cybernetic human machine brain, which is the next generation of phone technology. You know, you've watched the, the way the phone has evolved in 100 years and it's become more ergonomic and sexier all the time. It's like the phone wants to mate with us. <laughs> you know, the phone wants to get off with us and it's getting sexier all the time. And the next generation is radio telepathic communication, which means instant emails sent by blinking. <laughs> so what I see is this, as I say, this singular organism is now developing a cyborg like super cortex, which will link everybody soon enough. I think all the wars, these things, these are the last gasp of that. And I may be being overly optimistic, but I do believe this is the last gasp of something. This is the last of the inoculation against evil that we were given. <laughs> you know, we had to go through a lot of things in order to understand them. But the next generation is really, the, the connectivity becomes so strong, I think it's unstoppable. It becomes a giant emergent self-aware brain. And it begins to realize that yes, it is indeed, it's all one thing. It's not a separated thing. It's not individuals. It's all part of a gigantic system that's learning and growing and complexifying. Even with that super cortex technology yeah. though, it's so hard for me at least to look at, at this and you know, having read Lord of the Flies in high school, <coughs> I, look, I look at this and I was like, well, what, what are we expecting? It's so much human nature mm -hmm. to uh, accrue power and then to allow that to corrupt and we're ha we have all these talks now about um, you know data privacy and yep. uh, you know a secure internet and everything and it's like well <laughs> what, what did you expect you know and I'm not saying yeah. I'm not saying it's right I am certainly not defending uh, you know you know but it's like now people are selling everyone's information to corporations so mm -hmm. that they can show you the exact ad on Facebook that you're likely to no, click on absolutely and yeah. I and I worry in some way that by mm. creating this technology and having it be something that is some somewhat classist mm. somewhat elitist that that does put money and power into the hands of the people who are already in charge are we not are we not creating mm. more division in that way by relying on this super tech that is only accessible if we comply. Well, it's an interesting way of looking at it, certainly. And that's, that's part of the truth, too. We don't live in a perfect system. We don't live in a utopia. So people are manipulating all of these processes for personal gain or for profit. But ultimately, I think the drive is towards a complexity that will wipe that out. Again, I don't think capitalism, or certainly late-stage decadent capitalism, as we now experience it, is, is 
got longer to go. It will probably be replaced by a system that's more fair and has to deal with a much bigger population of human beings. But no, I mean, none of these things, that these aren't utopias. I mean, I, I do not value the loss of privacy, but I do believe that for the next generation, privacy will mean, be meaningless. Privacy will be like nudity was to people in the 60s. You know? <laughs> it's like what you once thought this was important. But for me, for someone who was basically grew up in the, the Cold War and, 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 and during the age of surveillance and the prisoner and the terror of Big Brother, it's a horrifying prospect. So we have to understand, you know, it's, we, it's not necessarily something that we'll all agree on or all be happy with, but it seems to be an unstoppable process, I think. So. Yeah, it's, and there's very much, you know, you and I have discussed this a little bit, there's very much a huge shift that's happening in the last six months especially, yeah. you know, but, you know, arguably within the last year, uh, both on the micro and the macro levels. And there have been times that I've tried to bring that up to people and I find myself really <clears throat> having a loss of words to describe it. I'm mm -hmm. like, are you guys feeling, you guys feeling these shifts <clears throat> lately and feeling like that, that the energy is just changing and there's a really rapid acceleration. Some people are calling it an ascension. Some people say that, you know, we've, al we've always been on an ascension planet and now, you know, things are just accelerating more. How would you describe the things that are going on within our, our collective consciousness with this past year? Well, I kind of always go back to the Kabbalah because it's got really good, uh, it's a really nice structure, the, the Sephiroth, the tree of life, and it kind of describes the, the human process and it also describes civilizations and also describes the, the universe, so it's, it's an interesting map. And it kind of got there ahead of us because the, the, the idea, of the Kabbalists have this notion of the, 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 the structure is, is incomplete, the, the earth sphere hangs below the moon sphere on the structure of the tree of life and the Kabbalists who, of a more apocalyptic bent believe that this event will take place and it's a metaphorical event I mean these aren't these aren't you know things that happen in a, in a biblical cataclysmic ways but the metaphorical event is that the, the sphere of materiality is drawn up into the sphere of illusion and the moon represents illusion, the moon is daydreams, it's the inner world, you know, the Malkuth, the sphere of earth represents everything we can touch and measure and weigh. But they say, come this moment, come this ascension, if you want to call it that, these two spheres will be drawn together and it will repair the, the symmetry of the tree. And I think we have actually been witnessing the real world effects of that metaphorical event, which is the, the, sometimes called the descent or the collapse of the 32nd path. And the 32nd path is the universe, so what it's seen as, it's the end of the universe as we know it. And I think my own personal idea is that when the, the, the towers fell in, in 2001, that was the signal, that was the material signal of a metaphorical event beginning. And those two towers can be seen on the, the moon card of the tarot, where they, again they represent the, the boundary between illusion and reality. And suddenly those boundaries are gone. And during that time in the real world, again, not talking on the metaphorical plane, but in the real world, we've seen things like the rise of reality television, you know, scripted, scripted dramas. We've seen uh, games becoming more and more sophisticated until people are now the simulationist idea that we potentially even live inside a game. We've seen movie superheroes being explained in rational and plausible ways when these characters are completely irrational and implausible. And at the same time, on the opposite side, you know, reality and, and fiction have basically started to swap places. Our reality has become ridiculous, you know, we're, we're now looking at a world where Donald Trump can be in power <laughs> and it feels like we've gone down the rabbit hole. It's not anything like those weird paranoid Bush and Blair years where everything felt like we were at war. This is now the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, this is insanity, like the cognitive dissonance fake news, everything's a lie, it's the collapse of reality and illusion into this mess that we haven't quite learned how to sort out. As I say, you've got all virtual reality, augmented reality technology, everything is about the fusion of reality and illusion and I think that's what we're dealing with now and it's why society right now is so in flux and so bizarre and so pliable because it's, it's gone slightly insane, it took a drug that it can't handle <laughs> and it's having to deal with the consequences now.
So yeah, I think for us as magicians or as creative people, suddenly it feels like there's chinks in the armour, suddenly it feels like the space is to move again in a way that it didn't during what I think were quite uh, nihilistic times, you know, the, the, as I say, the Bush years, the, the Blair years. We're into psychedelic times now, it's got quite weird and I think, as I say, we can we can work with that, you know, suddenly there's, there's, there's places for us to go, there's, there's ways of fighting back. And then also in the sense that, you know, the right wing took over the techniques of magic, of NLP, all that stuff, Pepe the Frog memes, they took control of that for a long time and it's, it's time to come back on that, I think. <laughs> Yeah, the, the idea of narrative magic, which of course um, is something a concept that I was introduced to through your work, um, through your coining of the term hypersigil, which you know, for anyone who doesn't know is um, a sigil is a, a symbol that sets an intention. The, uh, the idea of, of a hypersigil adds the fourth element of time. So you're projecting uh, time through reality. You're creating a story as it happens, yeah. which for you happened in writing The Invisibles. You started writing a comic and as you've reported, things that you wrote started happening to you on about a three to six month delay. <laughs> and, uh, and I certainly know for myself that this has also happened with me where, where the idea of narrative magic, um, I found you know, in, in some, of my, some of my last relationships that um, you know, maybe, maybe for other people who are, I don't know, more normal than I am, maybe <laughs> they can have sexual fantasies that don't end up coming true. <laughs> But, uh, and that sounds great. It sounds like, oh, wow, that's amazing. But, but really, our fantasies are always so problematic. Like, that's why always, they're fantasies. Yeah, yeah. That's why they're taboo, is we keep them in that box. And unfortunately, you know, we open it up. It's like Pandora's box, <laughs> and they, they go everywhere. And then, then all, the, all this darkness, you know, all this stuff that we've, we've fantasized about ends up ap actually, actually happening to us in, in many ways. And I'm trying also to figure out whether that's, you know, you, you said something recently about, that ritual magic has started working again in a mm. way that it hasn't in years. You were like, it's like pushing a button yeah. and it just, you know, and, and so for me, as someone who began my journey into magic more seriously about three years ago, <clears> this is all, this all feels like, oh, I'm just, I'm just coming into this and I'm just seeing about, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just experiencing this now. But as I understand from you, it seems like there is actually a very real energetic shift where magic is working in a way that it hasn't yeah. in a while. I mean, it's, it's certainly the impression I get. I mean, I can't speak for everyone else, but it's been really quite obvious to me. And as, as we spoke about before, you know, it was, uh, it's expressed itself in this very feminine energy. For me, again, on the Kabbalistic tree of life, you know, working my way up through those spheres and spending a lot of time in the abyss. And as, as I've said to you before, all, all of these terrible experiences just turn into comic books for me. So there is no demon who doesn't get used as a character in the story and eventually, eventually ends up paying for the cat's food. So I spent a lot of time in the abyss and, and thinking about what that meant and that sphere of death, the invisible sphere, which is the, the kind of collapse of the black hole at the center of the tree of life. And on the other side of that is, is Bina, which is the feminine sphere. It's one of the, the three highest spheres on the tree. And I found that since then, it's, yeah, I mean, the ritual magic stuff worked again. Two little black cats who like the, the Black Panther is the, the zoo type of, of the goddess, you know, of, of Bina. And there's been all this feminine energy working on the Wonder Woman book and Wonder Woman being the, this comic book embodiment of truth and also realizing that there's this shift, I think, between the aeons, as Crowley called them, he, he, he divided the last few thousand years into different aeons. There was Isis, Osiris was the, the aeon of the lawgiver, and Horus was the latest one, who's this fiery warlike kid who just basically tears down all the structures, as we've seen kind of occurring. But alongside Horus comes his sister, Matt, who's the goddess of truth. So again, for me, all the energy has been, possibly just because I've been concentrating and thinking about this fear, has been feminine. And I really see that's the, that's the interesting potential for this century. I think the boys have had their long enough go at it. And it's time for the girls to take over, you know, and show us what kind of technology and, and art can be created when freed from the shackles of the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, and it seems to me like Wonder Woman really, with, with mm. how much she has come into cultural consciousness, you know, you're working on the comic now, the, the first book is out and the, yeah, the yeah, next two yeah. are on the way. And, and of course, we've just seen uh, the movie, you know, the movie mm. come out. And she really does seem to be mm. a herald of the return of the divine feminine. And a lot of people in the circles I travel in, in, in witchcraft and the occult, have, have spoken about this 
this yeah. shift, you know, and then this idea of this, for, for me, it's been like a Mary Magdalene energy mm -hmm. showing up and just so, so loud, so much going on in my brain that I've, you know, looked into the whole yeah, thing yeah. And, and, you know, and, and the idea of Mary, what Mary Magdalene represents is, is, um, is the lost feminine, you know, mm -hmm. who was, that she was supposed to have her, her rightful seat next to, to Jesus or Yeshua as yeah, his bride yeah. and as, as his equal, you know, just not just his partner, but also his equal, his twin flame and uh, and being being crushed by, you know, by the Vatican, essentially mm -hmm. being crushed by by the Catholic Church and, you know, smeared as, a, you know, a prostitute, quote unquote, and uh, and having all this mm -hmm. energy show up for me and so many other women that I know and being like, wow, wow, are you feeling this? Wow, I'm feeling this too. And there really is a call to to reinstate that equality because, and it's not about, you know, as, as you know, it's not about misandry. It's not about man-hating because that's just keeping us in that same divisiveness. <laughs> in a weird way, misandry is, <laughs> in, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's like reinforcing um, the, the fact that there is an equality there. It's, it's like if we don't, it, it's like by being in reactivity yeah. to patriarchy with <clears throat> misandry, we are acknowledging that it is a truth, you know, and that it would be more powerful mm -hmm. to just start acting as though everyone is equal so we can start to manifest that reality. But, you know, there's a lot of men who follow your work, of course, in, in comics. And if you could, if, if you were given the opportunity to to speak to your average, you know, say, 23-year-old comics reading guy who may be surrounded by so much influence on him saying, you know, oh, it's not fair that there's a women-only Wonder Woman screening, or we don't like <laughs> Zoe Quinn, you know, designing our video. It's really about ethics and journalism and all that stuff. You know, how, how would you communicate to that person about what... <laughs> what bliss there actually is <laughs> when there is that balance between yeah, the masculine I, and feminine. I would try to encode it in a story because if I think if I tried any other way I would just be open to the same old abuse <laughs> that yeah. everyone else is who dares put these ideas in front of people who don't want to listen to them but as I say we can use these symbols wondering is a really powerful symbol the fact that that movie is, has been so successful it, it didn't really surprise me but it's, it's certainly again it heralds something different so I mean those 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 boys who are surrounded by those images will have to deal with them in their own way and their own <laughs> unfortunate. But if they read some of the, the stories that I've written, hopefully it will get under their skin. It will get them at the subconscious level because I don't like to lecture people. You know, I think everyone just has to deal with their own nonsense and the way they've been brought up and how they then process that. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of negativity in the world, but sometimes it's best to ignore it completely. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also so relevant to what you say in your disinformation lecture about mad cow disease, yeah. about uh, here is this disease that gets into the body and takes it over because it disguises itself mm -hmm. as part of the immune system. Yeah. And so that comes back to you know the, the whole subject of this show about communication, about having our ideas infiltrate in ways that people can digest them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like gummy vitamins. You give them the things that they need in a, something that they're likely to actually eat. Absolutely, yeah. And for me, that a was spoonful also... spoonful of sugar, as maybe Poppins said. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Because nobody likes, you're right, yeah. nobody likes being lectured. You know, mm -hmm. no one, no one likes a confrontation yeah, where they're told that they're wrong. Combative position, you know, suddenly you're saying, well, you got this wrong, you don't understand this. Well, I'm sure there's a million reasons why you got this wrong and don't understand it. And some Sometimes you, I, I would be willing to engage with that. Other times I'm just not. You know, sometimes it's the best just to turn the sound down for yeah. people who don't get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's hard because this being so much mm -hmm. of our work in the world, it's like which battles do we choose? You know, <clears throat> and for you, where where is that line often? Where, as someone who was given an experience in Kathmandu and said, put this into your work and yeah. put it out there, how for you do you balance? your work in the world with your self-care? Oh, I don't know that I do. I mean, it's, it's, it just all goes into the stories. For me, it's all the one thing, you know. All the experiences I have translate immediately into the stories, and that hopefully that's why they connect to people. You know, when my, my father was dying, then I was able to write a story where Superman's father dies, and he's standing at his, his dad's funeral, and he says words that I could only dream of, having said at my actual dad's grave. But I was able to get all that feeling in there. You know, same goes when my mother was dying when the cats are born, when I meet new friends, everything goes into the work. And I think just by 
understanding that these things are, are powerful symbolic and al allegorical tools you know that's what I love about superheroes they're like they're like gods they, they're archetypal figures so rather than try and make them realistic in the way that the movies have done I always think it's much more interesting to accept the, the allegorical nature the symbolic nature of these characters and I think that's how you can really get under people's skin so for me the 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 apotheosis of that was I, I did a, a Superman comic where Superman rescues this young goth kid on a, a ledge. The kid's about to commit suicide. And Superman just appears and puts his hand on the kid's shoulder and says, it's okay, it's true, your doctor really did get held up. And he says, you're much stronger than you think you are, trust me, hugs the kid. And then I got emails from that actually saved young kids' lives from suicide. And to me, that's the only value of Superman that this thing made of paper and ink and colour could actually save somebody's life. That's what Superman's designed to do. Mm. So I think, yeah, if you, can, if you can give these symbols enough power, they actually do their jobs the way they're meant to and behave like gods. And with regard to magic sort of falling into the hands mm. of the alt-right mm -hmm. in the last several years, and especially I think that people like us can tend to underestimate the, the power that people have when they spend their lives entirely on the mm. internet because mm. we used to think oh you know it's just the internet you know go play outside go do something real with your life go you know go actually connect with people that's where the real world is but as we evolve more into a society where there is this super cortex and it is a very real thing it is something <clears throat> that can affect change in mm. the world and it's, it's scary when you think about how much free time <laughs> those people have to to push those agendas, yeah. you know, and to, to spend all day, you know, passing around the, the Pepe the Frog mm -hmm. memes and and uh, having this this weird, it's it's like there's a whole double life on mm -hmm. the internet. But for people who actually want to be healthy, we don't <clears throat> want to, we don't have the resources, the time, and the willingness to engage on that battlefront as much as those people who you know, as I've, as I've read, feel that they have nothing to live for. You yeah. know, these young men who are graduating with <clears throat> so much student loan debt, if they even weren't able to go to college at all, and sure. sitting around all day with nothing to do except wait for gigs to come up, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the gig economy, and sitting there just, you know, on Reddit and 4chan, just, just pumping all this, all this information out there. That, and it does, it disseminates and it changes the culture. And what do we, what do, we do about that? Well, How do we fight that battle? It's just, it's it's magic, you know. It's these, as you say, the people with, with very little hope or future who suddenly have power, they suddenly have meaning, they suddenly have significance in that world. You know, of, of course they're going to embed themselves in that world because that is the one world where they can make change and effect change. And I think all pe people are just looking for agency, you know, particularly at times like ours where things are kind of feel a bit out of control. So people are looking for agency and there's no... It's we look in our own places for agency, but these kids are looking there for agency, but all they want is agency. And I think, again, the, the best thing to do is understand all of it. And it's all part of the, this organism. It's all part, it's all, it's learning all of these things. It has all these contradictory viewpoints. If we absorb all the contradictory viewpoints, if we can see all of them, we might get a higher level view of what this thing actually is and how it thinks. Why is it contradict itself? Why does it fight itself? Why? We need to understand all that, and it's, it's maybe not those kids' job to understand that, but it's our job to understand that, mm. so that we might as well do that, whether they, they don't like that or not. So again, it's not, it's not a fight or a war, I think, it's, it's just about understanding, it's about understanding how everything fits together in the structure, and some of it seems a bit scary, and some of it seems like as if it's, it's against us. But it's just everyone's trying to learn stuff, everyone's trying to make sense of this bizarre rocket ride that we're all on. And do you believe that, you know, of course there's, <clears throat> as I'm sure you're familiar with, there is that kind of school of thought that is circling that Pepe the Frog is representative of the Egyptian frog god Kek or Keku, who is the bringer in of light and, and who is the, you know, the, the dark before the dawn and the, you know, the storm before the calm, mm -hmm. who is bringing in all this chaos so that things can be shaken up and that we have to go through this dark period to get past it and then to find mm. the light. Do you believe that the pathway is through creating this divisiveness to the point where we can't even stand it anymore? Or do you think that there is 
there, that there is merit to trying to come from a place of unity, even, even with so much chaos around us. Yeah, I think, as I say, I mean, as, and as Timothy Leary always said, find the others. It's as simple as that. Connect with as many people who understand what you're talking about and who have a similar perspective. That's the best you can do. And reach out as much usefully as you can do using art or music or whatever to touch other people in a more symbolic fashion. So you have your inner circle of people you can talk to directly about stuff. Then you're talking in a much wider cultural context about things in a more you know, as I say, metaphorical way. And I think that's really, again, it's all we can do. It's, uh, I, I just don't see it as a war, I don't see it as a fight. But yeah, we have to, we kind of have to gather in as much as we possibly can, but also do not be messed up by it. There are parts of the structure that do that. There are parts of the structure that will always be policemen, you know. <laughs> and I was never going to grow up to be a policeman. I was always a part of the structure that would grow up to be a writer or a creative person. So. You know, and I've said it before, I think I probably said it in this info, are there ever any years where no teachers get born? Are there ever any years where no policemen get born? No, there always seems to be, as long as the system and structure needs them, the system provides policemen and judges, and one day it will hopefully outgrow that, you know, maybe it will figure out how to get past that, and people won't need money, and it will be like Star Trek, which I hope. <laughs> but right now that's what we've got, and it's, you know, people who are, are self-aware and who are really trying to do some work on themselves to see you know what, what's the optimum understanding what how best can i understand my place in this and be useful then all we have to do is keep communicating you know and it will get out it'll get out through movies and and records or whatever so it's really more about creating the art that's going to change people's minds than it is about actually trying to change their minds by confronting them no, I think you could do that. I mean, obviously there's some brilliant communicators who could probably, I'm sure you could get somebody here right now <laughs> and convince them something completely different from what they imagined they were coming into. But yeah, I mean, everybody just has to play their part. All I can say is my part has always been to make these stories. You know, I'm sure some other people are really great and they could walk into a room of raving right-wing lunatics and calm them with a single word. Then that person needs to do that job, you know, and that's, that's that person's part in the structure. So it's all just find what we're best at, find how we can be most useful doing that and then do it. So after all these years, do you still trust nature? Yeah, I kind of do. I mean, it's just an emergent thing. I don't trust it not to give me cancer <laughs> or to, to be really cruel. But, you know, I trust nature to be an emergent, complexifying process that probably is, is, is leading somewhere. It's probably all these fractal self-similarities have have a meaning, have an actual underlying, there is a structure, it's all for something, I still believe that, yeah, but, but nature can be cruel and capricious as well, but you know, that's, that's part of the fun. Yeah, and that's, that's also, that's, you know, part of, part of the struggle I think is, there is a certain amount of nihilism in saying like, well, we're all part of nature and, you know, nature mm -hmm. made us and we made the atom bombs and therefore, <clears throat> you know, whatever happens and of course the planet, the planet will survive. You know, we, we have all this talk about climate change, which of course mm -hmm. is incredibly important, but it's really, it's really <laughs> to preserve us. It's really yeah, to make no, sure that, <laughs> that the planet can sustain us. The planet will be fine mm -hmm. without us. And, you know, uh, there, will, there will be other life that will, that will yeah, figure out how to live. As you know, there have been several mass extinctions on this planet. It's just, uh, it's had a really good run though. We, we're pretty smart and it'd be a shame to have this one wiped out. And as I say, I think, that, I think the reason there are almost 8 billion people on the planet is that there's a, a rationale behind it. I think it wants to become super connected. It's like the axons and dendrites in the brain. It needs to complexify. So maybe you need just 8 billion and the thing lights up. Maybe it'll take 10 billion and the thing lights up. And who knows what that will all mean. But I think there's a reason why there's so many of us and why there's so many more of us and why we're linking together. I think also when you when you bring up how many people there are on the planet, I think we're also still living in so many mm. modes that are outdated because we're still, you know, we have not evolved, <coughs> our brains have not evolved to the point where we're equipped naturally mm. to deal with the society we live in. And of course, as someone who taught pickup for many years, yeah. I dealt with men facing approach anxiety. And it's like, what is the story behind approach anxiety? Well, when you lived in a hundred person tribe, if someone <laughs> rejected you, everyone else was gonna know about it. And then that would be really embarrassing. Whereas now, you know, there's, you know, however, you know, like five million people in one city alone, you go yeah. into a bar, but you still feel that <laughs> same, that same, you know, uh, anxiety about, 
uh, about approaching, about saying hello and about being rejected because you're still on some level um, facing at least the neurological fear of ostracism from your yeah, tribe. Of course. And one of the things that people are starting to talk about in regard to the return of the feminine and how the masculine needs to adjust itself in order to change is that we have so much pressure on men that is self-imposed. You know, granted they are they are doing it to themselves. That doesn't mean that they don't deserve our compassion, mm -hmm. but it is it is an Ouroboros. It is it is a self-sustaining system where we tell men, you know, we, we value you for your ability to you know, go out and hunt to be a provider. We value you if you survived coming back from the war. You know, um, all of these, all of these different things that that essentially do not program in men the things that we need from them right mm. now, which is about nurturing, which is about listening, which is about healing the relationship, healing sacred union, so that we can come into this balance of equality. And I ask myself every day, how can we, how can we? show men what we need from them in a way that shows compassion to the ways that they're already programmed but also inspires them to be better. Well, again, by, by stalking them like prey <laughs> and understanding why men do what they do and why they say what they say. Because, uh, you know, as I've said, I think guys are quite simple. We can be very creative, but the behavioural side of it is, is, is quite simple. So I, I think people are fairly easy to understand if you're willing to make the effort and look into how the machine works. And then once you know how the machine works, you can start tweaking it any way you like. But again, culture will change. Everything's changing around us. You know, we, we live in a world where male sperm count is declining, where, you know, it's, uh, the boundaries, again, between male and female are becoming more fluid. You know, there's a lot more gender fluid kids out there who openly identify with no particular sex or one or the other, depending on, on how they, they want to play the day. So. I think we're seeing a decline of masculinity anyway. Again, it's like we can all do what we can to help in every individual case and any good idea you have, you know, apply it. But it's, it's a natural phenomenon. It seems to be a natural declining phenomenon. You know, guys are, are kind of losing their grip on what it used to be to be male and becoming much more sedentary creatures who have basically linked up brains. So I think, again, it's an unstoppable process that you can... Uh, can add to by compassion and kindness, like as, as ever, you know, the same old, the weapons of peace, they always work, but it's an unstoppable thing, guys are, guys are disappearing <laughs> in the traditional sense. Which comics characters would you say embody the new masculinity best? Oh, I don't know, it's hard to say because I think, I think an aspect of masculinity always has to be the fantasy of, of, of Batman, you know, everyone loves Batman because he's super sexy, he wears leather, he goes out at night, you know, his fetishistic costume, he's pursued by all these women who also wear fetish costumes and they have fantastic thrilling fights on rooftops. And you know, he gets up at 3 p.m., he's got a butler who brings him his dinner, it's like he's got the best shit in the world. So there is that, that the, the idea of Batman or Tony Stark, the Iron Man, which I think is a, a masculine fantasy which is going to be hard to eradicate because it's so fun and it promises so much, but it's, it's, I, I think it's probably better than say the James Bond fantasy or the soldier or the gangster fantasy. So to me, you know, Batman's always going to be cool. Superman is more like a Buddhist figure, so I think he's an interesting character for men to meditate on. He is the Superman. And for me, Superman was always, rather than being a, a science fiction character, again, he's an allegorical character. He's, he's, he's just maleness blown up, he's what every meek guy or every downtrodden guy or every guy underneath his shirt is this active dynamic force and I, th I think he's interesting to meditate on for those reasons, you know, because the, the difference between him and Batman is that Clark Kent is irresponsible, he has a boss, he pines for the girl in the office who doesn't even care about him, he lives the life of an ordinary person. And so when he walks his dog, he, yeah, he still has to walk his dog, but he walks it around the rings of Saturn. You know, he's got his man cave, but it's in a gigantic ice citadel at the North Pole. He's, he's got friends and relatives, but they come from the future. And so really, Superman is just guys. It's just their, their fantasies. It's how they feel inside. So looking at these kind of characters, I think Superman and Batman are just my favourites for those reasons. One represents the fetishy, plutonian, sexy, nightclubbing side of us, and the other represents the super responsible, kind old ladies, you know, walks his dog version of men. And I think if we had to have two poles, you know, that's, uh, those are kind of useful poles for guys to think about as they uh, head forward into a future of declining sperm counts <laughs> and loss of maleness. 
And you're also working on a new TV show that's coming out in November, correct? Yep. Called Happy, and that's going to be on the Sci-Fi Channel. How? Tell us a little bit about that, <clears throat> and tell and tell us how you feel that that narrative also weaves into the current cultural consciousness. Well, Happy was something I came up with a while ago, and it was again it was a way of doing something simple that was uh, about complicated feelings. So I, I kind of wanted to do a crime comic, but I wanted to do my take on a crime comic. And at the time, I was watching all those Simon Cowell shows, you know, American Idol and you know, the pop brat, <laughs> whatever they are. And he'd come on, you'd see all these kids singing and dancing, especially ethnic kids, especially poor kids. And they'd sing and dance, and they'd, they'd belt out these anthems, and he would just sit there and go, nah, nah, you're horrible. And at the same time, I was looking online, you could see actors would be crushed beneath the weight of somebody just saying, oh, you're utterly rubbish, you're fat, you're ugly. Everyone was under attack from this jaded, geriatric kind of sensibility where it was just no matter what was presented, it was meh. So Happy became about that and I thought if I could create a character who represented the worst of those impulses and this, this character Nick Sachs and he's a Scrooge for this, what's basically a Christmas story and he's a hitman, he used to be a great cop, he's ended up as a hitman for the mob and things go wrong one night and he wakes up and there's a little blue horse on his chest with wings and it's got a unicorn horn and it just says I'm happy the horse and you're the only other person in the world who can see me and happy says I'm the little girl's imaginary friend this is amazing she's in real trouble and you have to help me save her and that's how we set up this story but really for me it's about these colliding the super cynical grizzled jaded fed up Hitman and this indefatigable little Walt Disney cartoon horse that will never give up its enthusiasm or optimism. And just slamming the two of those together has been uh, great fun. <laughs> and we're seeing so much of that in, in the, current, the current culture too. It, it, actually, it actually reminds me a little bit of the inverse of the fearless girl statue. It's like, yeah. you know, the, here we have, you know, the, the little girl energy actually being embodied in, in a human mm. and, you know, the, the old patriarchal, mm. cynical Wall Street being embodied, mm. you know, by the bull, you know. Yeah, so yeah. but it's that same it's that same dynamic. We're having this this feminine energy, this this little girl energy show up in a lot of places lately in ways that um, that I think our our patriarchal matrix was not aware was so powerful until recently. Mm. Yeah, things things get underneath the fences, you know. <laughs> These things happen when no one's looking and suddenly they crop up everywhere in culture and suddenly, yeah, I do think it's mainstream now for me seeing the success of Wonder Woman meant that it was mainstream. Those energies have kind of hit the limelight, they've been noticed at last. And, and where that goes, you know, is there's a, it could take another 100 years, 500 years to, to really change culture or it could happen overnight, you know, we don't know. But it's certainly, you can feel the change and, and, and you know, I don't know if everyone feels it. I know, I know you've said you've certainly noticed something I notice something other people I've spoken to feel the same. So I don't know, is it just pop culture shifts is it, or is it something deeper? And um, in terms of Wonder Woman and mm -hmm. especially the way that, that Wonder Woman is so terrifically prescient right now in our, in our current consciousness, how much can you tell us about, uh, because you are a magician mm -hmm. and because as, as we all know, the things that, you know, what we speak, we create mm -hmm. and we are so capable of influencing culture and of making creating change through our stories without you know without giving up too much away of the plot can you talk a little bit about what your intention is with the Wonder Woman comic? Well the main thing for me was firstly to go back to the, the ideas of the creator of Wonder Woman who's William Moulton Marston along with his wife Elizabeth who were both uh, psychiatrists in the 1930s when it was a kind of interesting thing to be and, and they got their names in the papers they lived in a polyamorous relationship with uh, a young woman, Olive Byrne, who was the physical model for Wonder Woman. So the original idea of Wonder Woman came out of Marston's fascination with uh, bondage, because he was really into that as well, and he believed that basically men would do much better if they submitted to the loving authority of a powerful female figure. And in his case, he created the Society of Amazons, ruled over by the Queen Hippolyta. And his original version of Wonder Woman she has no weapons, she, she has two bracelets that can deflect any projectile and she has a lasso which can, she swings it around you and you have to compel to obey her and to also to tell the truth. So no one had kind of gone near that for so long, you know, the current version of Wonder Woman is like Xena, a warrior princess and I think it's a great, it's a great powerful, potent image, 
But she's got a sword and shield and she's like a Greek warrior and she comes from a culture where they haven't progressed at all beyond, you know, like Homeric times. So we went back to the original and in the original it's a science fiction culture. So we kind of developed that for the book and the notion that given 3,000 years away from men, which is what the Amazons did, they isolated themselves on Paradise Island and, and created their own culture, all women. They were immortals as well, which made life even more interesting for them, I'm sure. But it was going back to that idea and think, what would happen if you were given 3,000 years to create culture, you know? And they'd all presumably had sex with one another a million times over these centuries. And the, the idea was that, you know, let's, let's really think about this, the bondage and submission society and how that would work. It would be a kind of, sex would become utterly aesthetic after all these centuries of having sex with the same women all the time. And it would become this thing, I imagined, of, of ritual, you know, it'd be, it'd be like uh, a Japanese tea ritual or something, but it'd be sexual and their whole society would be formed around this. So we kind of went in on that basis of what would the technology be that was completely non-patriarchal, what would the art be, what would the poetry be, what would these women actually be like? And it was to, to get away from the current notion of what in 3,000 years they did nothing <laughs> except ride horses. Well, our, our society of Amazons created you know, technology that is far beyond anything in the, the, the male world. And that's what the story is ultimately going to be about, is just to tackle those, to, to deal with that energy, the, the, the Bina energy, as I call it, the female energy, to find an, an outlet for it, symbolic, allegorical in this Wonder Woman story. So yeah, Diana, the, the Wonder Woman, is going to have to face very different challenges. It's not like monsters, it's, 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 uh, it's people trying to get under our defences in, in very different ways and even to manipulate the idea of truth and the idea of loving submission and bondage and how that can so easily be perverted in our society into meaning something different. Yeah, and, and especially yeah. on that, you know, on that last note about, um, about taking that um, taking that energy of, of loving authority, you know, of BDSM that can be so positive and yet can also be so negative at the same time. And we're coming, I, I think it's, it's really interesting, you know, to look at the lasso of truth in a culture where <coughs> words like gaslighting have really come mm -hmm. into the mainstream, where we're talking about a nation being gaslit by a president, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which, which um, whether you agree with, with that fitting the definition of gaslighting or not, we are definitely having our version of truth mm -hmm. messed with on a large level. Yep. The idea of fake news, you know, the fake media, um, propaganda, and, and who we can really trust in society right now, and mm -hmm. how many people are also buying into lies that are comfortable, you know? And, and I think that a theme that has been showing up for me, which I think is I'm assuming is also part of the cultural consciousness, mm -hmm. is taking this kind of safety in slavery versus this dangerous freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, do you want to be, do you want to yeah. be a battery in the matrix? Do you want to be, you know, plugged in and, and um, the lie is that, you know, we'll take care of you, you'll be fine, you'll, you'll be in the bubble, you know, and, and of course that's, mm -hmm. it's a lie, <laughs> as we know, <laughs> as so many Mar Americans who are, facing the possibility of losing their health care, yeah. understand, versus understanding that um, can we really trust anyone other than the people that we trust ourselves and other, other than our own experience, you know, having, um, uh, I, I think the parallel is really interesting when you consider that Neil Strauss, who mm -hmm. was, you know, the predominant pickup artist who wrote the game yep. and you know looking at looking at all the ways that the game plays right into the patriarchy where it's taking this structure of life as we know it and and gaming mm -hmm. it um, you know and, and a couple of years after he wrote that he wrote a book called emergency about survivalism yeah. and yeah. you know being able to survive in the wild and and it's kind of this I think we're coming to this crossroads now where it's do we you know do, do we do we accept our complicity in the super cortex mm -hmm. in order to you know okay well um, and you know, Amazon Prime can have all of my, you know, all of my information about what I order late at night. But you know, at least, at least I can, at least I can get, you know, delivery mm -hmm. at three in the morning. Or, you know, or do we go back to this? Okay, this is, you know, this is, this is a dangerous place for us to live in, and the only thing we can trust is the very ground under our feet. You know, do we go to these sustainable communities that are popping up now, saying, okay, we have, we have our own ecosystem now. Mm -hmm. We grow our own food. We don't need to rely on, on anything. And so when you consider Wonder Woman as her, her weapon being the lasso of truth, <laughs> it's like, yeah, who do, we, who do we trust? Who do we trust and how do we navigate that, that binary? 
who do we trust? No one on TV, that's for <laughs> sure. Uh, you trust the people that you, your instincts you get on with, but you know, again, we'll always get it wrong. It's, it's, it's asking us to be superhuman, to understand how it all works and who we can trust. I think most of us develop a certain degree of discrimination that allows us to trust certain people, or even certain people we see on TV can be quite convincing. So we just have to rely on discrimination. But again, it's, it, it's, I, I can't see it as binary. It's, it becomes, then it becomes conflict again. It's, it's about trying to understand. It's about trying to make sense. And you can't make sense of everything. We're not, as I say, superhuman. We don't live long enough to get smart. You know, so <laughs> we just do what we can given the information that we can. And I always say, I mean, things like, for me, I'd, I just practice radical ignoring. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's wrong sometimes. My dad was an activist and he was always on, on, you know, picket lines and he was always on marches. And ultimately, he had small victories and, and things happened, but he was never happy with what he'd achieved doing that. And so for me, it's about getting under all, it's about getting under rather than make it obvious that you're opposition, you know, by wearing a, a V for Vendetta mask or by wearing certain things, become invisible, as I say, you know. Become invisible, don't respond to Donald Trump's tweets, ignore him, he's a narcissist, you know, he'll, he'll collapse under his own weight soon enough anyway. And even just as an experiment, ignore him for a week, because so many of my friends are like, he's taking up residence daily in their heads, and I don't think he's, he's worthy of spending a lot of time in there, so I'd always caution them against paying attention to what this buffoon has to say, or responding to it, or feeling riled up by it, because of course you'll feel riled up by a buffoon. Best to not hang about with buffoons. So, yeah, sometimes, I mean, it, sometimes it feels more like it's time to engage, and other times it feels like time to engage on, as I say, the symbolic or metaphorical level, and sometimes it feels like it's not worth engaging at all. You know, and just playing with the, the other, the energies that are around and finding practical and meaningful and, and positive ways of using them. Given all the energies that are happening now and what we're seeing, and um, I know we have to wrap up, so I'm going to end on, yeah. this, on, on this note, on, uh, on a positive note. Given everything that is going on, while looking at those different elements realistically, what do you think, what do you see as the best possible outcome if you could create the future <coughs> of Earth from here, yeah. where do you think we go? Something like a cross between Star Trek and Barbarella. <laughs> <to be honest>. <laughs> 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 yeah, just like no money, everybody cool, everybody having a good time, exploring endlessly, you know, infinite frontiers, you know, the boundaries are broken down between everything. So that is my idea. I think it's more likely to be something, as I say, it'll be a, an awakening of, a, of a, a large scale organism. I don't know when that'll happen, 500 years down the line, 1000 years down the line, next week. It will just depend on the, the, the connectivity and how it suddenly wakes up to itself. So there's that possibility as well. I mean, I imagine that we could also suddenly grow beyond our larval stage and leave the planet Earth and move into the fifth dimension where we belong. So, you know, again, that could happen next week. <laughs> it just depends how much we can link everyone together and how much we can overcome our sense of individuality and our sense of division. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining us here tonight. You're welcome, it's, it was great fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's been an incredible <laughs> honor. And thank you all for watching and remember to check out Grant Morrison's show Happy, which is on the Sci-Fi Channel in November. And also watch for the coming out of Wonder Woman books two and three as well. I am your host, Arden Lee. This has been Peace Talks. And until next month, please go out in the world and speak peacefully. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs>
deepest depths, I'll be by your side. Hold you close and wipe the mud from your eyes as we sleep. right for my particular identity but as I am yeah you, you know when, when you get on the path of surrender and you set an intention and and you align yourself and you you state to the universe to the planets to God or whoever you want to call it and you say um, this is my intention this is what I want to do then the things that you're meant to be doing show up in very obvious manners and so uh, I don't want to limit myself either, but I would say that chaos magic is the form of magic that makes the most sense to me, yeah. and that's kind of the, the basis for where I do everything else. And then, actually, a question for both. And how about you? Are you a chaos magician? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think I'm coming out of that closet as yeah. a chaos magician, <laughs> and I think that yes, um, actually, I've coming got out of the broom closet. I've got a story that it's a quick one, but you know, you're sort of the lightning rod for me truly accepting. Chaos magic. Okay, I'm glad. And it has to do with Comic Con. I'm not sure if you remember this. It was a couple years back. Yeah. And, and it also involves a friend Danica here. Hey. Hey. Danica, <laughs> if you might remember, she uh, she has a show. She's called Girl 19. Yeah, she has yeah. a show about comic books. And when she was staying with me at this loft downtown, <clears throat> and one of the things she wanted to do was talk to you mm -hmm. during that con. Because you were there, she was there, she doesn't always go to the Comic Con, and Comic Con's impossible. You've got 150,000 people. Oh, I know. Or more <laughs> swarming the streets. You've probably got another 50,000 people who don't have tickets that are just there for the surrounding events. And so I determined that I was going to some way put you guys, you two together. And on like the second day, you walk right by while I'm waiting for her. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember, yeah, but I, I had to oh. wait for like five minutes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm texting, I'm like, I pinned him down, he's right here. <laughs> and you were nice enough to give me the five minutes while she was <laughs> trapped by a train. And Already there, that's like mathematical impossibility. That, that shouldn't have been able to happen. And then, because she couldn't make it and you needed to go somewhere, I was very appreciative you waited as long as you did, but the, um, then two days later, we were headed to the con, and I was like drawn to go to the Wired Cafe thing, and I'm like, just come on, come on, come on, come on. And I already also determined, I was like, one way or another, I'm freaking doing this, you're going to connect. And we get off the elevator, again, there's 200,000 people, and I see Grant standing there. So it just immediately I Remember happened. the elevator? Yeah. Oh, well, it's, yeah. <laughs> and so th those types of things means you know, that, that's impossible. You have to be able to will, we have to be able to track through you know, the, the proper approach. And, uh, and you know, it keeps, accepting chaos magic is a way to make the world interesting. It's not yep. predictable anymore because now you're participating with it. You're helping predict what mm. is predictable. And it becomes like a dance, I always say, you know, it's a dance. It's, uh, when you dance with it, it starts to dance back, and you learn the steps, and it becomes more intricate yeah, and, and interesting. And the difference between it being mm. a force of will, mm. where you're trying to make something bend your way, versus trying to create a situation where you're both attracted to that mm. result, is exactly that dance. Yeah, it's participation. You know, yeah. it's, and, and the will is, is about bringing things into reality, because as you know, magic, isn't just something that happens in your head, that's what they called the astral plane in the good old days. And all that happens in the imagination is, is fantastic, but unless you use will and bring it across the abyss into actuality, then it's not really magic. So it's all about bringing things into the world. That could be, as, as I always say, it could be a poem, it could be a, a child, it could be a bridge, it could be a demon. But your idea is, is to make something real. The magic has to happen in all these scales, all these uh, spheres at the same time. So always, you know, it's, it's what, that's what chaos is about. It's make sure you're participating in the physical world as well in order to allow things to happen, to make pathways of coincidence, to, to get to meet people that you're interested in, to, to make it real in the real world is the important thing about magic. So do you think will is in some ways the willingness to accept the responsibility 